Good morning. Hey, good morning, Dr. Wolpoff. Um, my name is Razib Khan, and I blog at Gene Expression at Discover Blogs. And I'm Milford Wolpoff. I'm a professor of anthropology at the University of Michigan. A paleo anthropologist. Okay, so um, I will give a quick overview of uh, our general topic really um, quickly, and uh, I will present it from a layperson's perspective. Basically, um, I first heard of Dr. Wolpoff's work about, um, well, uh, it's been almost 25 years now, um, and it was on a NOVA documentary on the PBS um, science show NOVA in the 1980s, about 1987. Uh, I remember that. Yeah, and um, basically it was about the out of Africa hypothesis, which at the time had just kind of made a big media splash, and um, Dr. Wolpoff was presented somewhat as a dissenter um, to the new ascending orthodoxy that was coming onto the scene. The basic hypothesis was that approximately 200,000 years ago, one single group of humans in East Africa arose who gave rise, who gave rise to all of humanity that is alive today. Um, they expanded out of Africa and replaced the other hominid populations such as Neanderthals in Europe um, who did not contribute any genes to modern populations. Um, this original hypothesis was based upon genetic evidence. Um, at the time, it was it, the, new, the new data in favor of it was genetic evidence, which, which showed that uh, mitochondrial DNA, which is passed through the mother, uh, came from one relatively um, recent last common ancestor, and that Africans were most diverse on this lineage, indicating that they were the, the basal population, the root. Um, in any case, it, there was also a paleoanthropological um, uh, group who supported this hypothesis through morphology. Um, Chris Stinger was the most prominent advocate of that. Uh, Dr. Wolpoff uh, did not agree with that model on a paleoanthropological basis, and he also had other objections um, from a genetic perspective on the out of Africa hypothesis. And um, his model was uh, is termed multi regionalism. And um, the basic overview, and Dr. Wolpoff will um, elaborate on this is that modern humans do not descend from just one human population in the recent past. They descend from multiple populations in the recent past. So Neanderthals were not, quote, a necessary evolutionary dead end, but they might contribute something to, say, modern Europeans. So there was some regional continuity um, between very ancient populations and modern populations in any given region that you can see in the morphology um, when you look at the, at the at the fossils. So uh, basically, those are the two different models. And up until, I would say, last year, uh, the out of Africa, at least in the popular mind, had, had, multi had, had marginalized multi-regionalism. Um, basically, most people assumed, um, even when the scientific community, I would say, especially I know from the genetics, that, uh, that the out of Africa hypothesis was correct, and that Neanderthals, for example, did not contribute anything to the genome of modern human beings. Uh, I say within the last year because in June a paper came came out which showed that in the in the human genome, when you compare it to the Neanderthal genome, which has recently been extracted from fossils, um, a small amount, approximately 3 to 4 percent of the genome of people outside of Africa seems likely have to co have come in from Neanderthals. And just recently, a month and a half ago now, a paper came out, I believe it was in Nature, um, <clears throat> which shows that Oceanian populations, Papuans, Melanesians, probably Aboriginals, have an additional 3 to 4 percent um, admixture from another ancient hominin um, population, which are not Neanderthals. Um, they call them Denisovans. Probably they're from Eastern Eurasia somewhere. Um, the original um, genome or sequence of that is derived from a, a fossil in Siberia. Um, I threw a lot out there because there's a lot that's been thrown at science over the last year, but the short of it is uh, out of Africa with total replacement, which basically means that we're all just descended from Africans who arose or who left Africa 200,000 years ago, seems likely to be false. Uh, this matters because um, Dr. Wolpoff, his views are not necessarily marginal anymore, and I don't know if he would characterize them as marginal, but I mean, I think a lot of people... Well, I think we could talk about this. That's an interesting part of the question, to be honest. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I mean, like, I mean, what do you think? I mean, would you would, would you say you were marginal, or that people are giving you more attention now in term in terms of um, just looking at your old paper? I mean, I'll be honest. Um, I mean, you recommended I think a 2004 paper uh, by Caspary at all uh, for me to look at. But I mean, I've been looking at old papers um, that I probably didn't look at because, well, I mean, I didn't think they were necessarily valid to understanding what went what went on over the past 200,000 years. So. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, I, I think part of part of part of the way we have to look at this is uh, is public science because this is all about public science. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. If we're looking at science that scientists do, then uh, I would say that multi regional evolution for a very long time has been one of the uh, one of the two or three mm -hmm. ways that people accept that human evolution might have happened. Mm -hmm. And uh, I sometimes sit down with my friends and say, are we losing or are we winning? And when we look at this in terms of scientists, I, I never thought we were winning or losing. I always thought mm -hmm. that the profession was pretty much split in mm -hmm. half. Mm -hmm. But the public science perception is quite different. Okay. And okay. it's also true that what people believe, what people believe is not what they remember from reading a paper in Nature, it's what they read in the newspaper. Yeah, or they see, or they see a Popular news journal. weekly or in a documentary. That's right. Public science is very important. Mm -hmm. And in fact, around the time that that 1987 uh, 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 film came out, the video came out about Eve, we were taking a real shellacking. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize for a while what kind of shellacking we were mm -hmm. taking. Mm -hmm. uh, you write in your blog when you discuss us about the uh, AAAS, the National, uh, the American Association for the Investment of Science mm -hmm. presentation we gave, that was all publicity. Mm -hmm. Because by that time in our lives, we realized that we had to do publicity. Publicity. Yeah, yeah. We went from Alan Wilson. Alan Wilson never had a thought where there wasn't a press conference. Okay. And I'm not saying that in a sarcastic way. It, it was good. It worked. When he, when he had an idea, people found out what it was very quickly. We, I never understood that in the 1980s. Okay. Um, a long time to understand. If, if for people to understand you, you have to get the word out in a way that people will, will read it and consider yeah. it. And putting it in a paper somewhere, it doesn't do sure. it. Sure. Sure. Um, should we um, just, uh, Alan Wilson, just so um, the viewers and listeners know, uh, he's a, a biochemist who was uh, the mentor of the researcher who published the Mitochondrial Eve paper. And um, he's basically a geneticist, uh, a geneticist who got involved in paleoanthropology starting in the late 60s and 70s. And, you know, he was very prominent in the debates. and. I mean, would you say... Yeah, he, he, was one, he was one of several people that studied mitochondrial DNA. Mm -hmm. That's the DNA in the mitochondria, which is part of our mm -hmm. cells. It's on the outside of the nucleus. Mitochondrial DNA is an old, old... Uh, people knew about this a long time. Mm -hmm. They knew there were mitochondria. By the 1950s, they knew there were DNA. People never understood it well. Mm -hmm. Uh, so people never really worked out what the maternal inheritance meant. The fact that we now know that mitochondrial DNA and the mitochondria themselves, for the most part, come from our mothers, mm -hmm. and they don't come from our fathers, yeah. and there's no bad contribution as there is in the nuclear material. Mm -hmm. People didn't understand what it was. And I have to say that, that Alan Wilson and Rebecca Kahn, the student, really worked it out. Mm -hmm. They figured out how mitochondrial systems mm -hmm. worked, how they were inherited, and what it meant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that was, you can't give them too much credit for this. You can't give them too much credit for this. It was mm -hmm. a astounding new way of looking at, at the piece of genetics, which turned out to be so important later because when we look at preserved DNA from the past, ancient DNA, there's a lot more mitochondrial DNA than any other kind, a lot more nuclear DNA yeah. because there's so many mitochondria in your yeah. cells. So yeah. all in all, mitochondrial DNA has played an absolutely critical role in the last 40 years, 30 years. Yeah, 35 years uh, of studying genetics. Dr. Rovell, let me just uh, really? uh, review really quickly for the people out there who, you know, for them, mitochondria, you know, they're not uh, cytologists. So uh, basically, mitochondrial DNA is DNA within the mitochondrion, which is uh, it's an organelle. It's, um, it's, a, it's a system within the cell that, that basically creates energy or, or powers. It basically, it basically produces yeah, energy. Yeah, and it's yeah. passed only from mother to mother to mother in humans. So uh, mitochondrial DNA is a DNA that's tracing the direct maternal lineage. 
So that was why the focus was on mitochondrial Eve. It was the foremother um, when you when you go back 200,000 years. And obviously, um, and for technical reasons, it's also easy to analyze um, mitochondrial DNA, as Dr. Wolpoff was saying, because it's copious um, before you know PCR. It was it was easy to get um, out of out of specimens. Yeah, yeah. Also, and, and, it was, and it was easy. It was easy to sequence because yeah. it's really short. Yeah. There's there's about 16,000 yeah. base pairs. Yeah. I mean, your your nuclear DNA has some three billion mm -hmm. base pairs. And also. The mitochondria have about 16,000 base yeah. pairs, so it's a really finite amount yeah. of, uh, and it, of genetic material. And it doesn't get all mucked up because there's no recombination. Exactly, exactly. So the, the, there, the, are the, some, there are some technical reasons why there was an early focus on mitochondrial DNA. Uh, in regards to human evolution, and it just it, it kind of shows how the technique or method can constrain the arc of, of scientific understanding in a way because it it doesn't look right now. Um, I know people will probably look at the data that there are that it looks like out of Africa does work relatively well for mitochondrial DNA, um, and at this point we have other avenues genetically to test the model and those do not all line up with the mitochondrial DNA. But um, let me um let me ask you Dr. You know, let, 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 me, let me do okay. something because in a way let, can we straighten a few things out about theory? Okay. Okay. Because uh, I think there's I think there's some amount of misunderstanding okay. even still about what these theories okay. are. The original the original argument that took place was an argument about punctuating equilibrium versus gradual. Okay. The punctuating equilibrium argument was that every time there's a big change in the human species, it means that there was a speciation. Yes. And a new species replaced the old one. Yes. And you know that as the Eve theory. Yeah. Okay. Uh, a new species called modern humans appeared in Africa mm -hmm. uh, some thousand years ago and replaced everybody else around the world. And they were at the, their advantages were the advantages of the new species, bigger brain, better language. It depends on who you listen to, but they had advantages, which is why they could replace everybody. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The multi-regional theory is a gradualism theory that says evolution takes place over wide areas uh, under natural selection, and that whenever a new feature appears that's adaptive when it helps you, it can spread everywhere around the species. Sure. And so that there is never a total replacement of one one you know, one series of populations by another. The out of Africa thing, in a way, is difficult, and it's never really been clarified uh, in public science because both of these theories accept the idea that most people lived in Africa for most of human evolution. Yeah. We wrote this really clearly in 1984. Okay. We wrote the center edge idea that the Africa was the beginning of the human species. It's where most people live. It's where there was most variation. Okay. And most gene flow, we wrote that, went from Africa to other places. So that, that part of out of Africa is the same in both of, uh, both of these theories. Okay. The difference is, is we, we think that we understand that the gene flow out of Africa ended up mixing with other people. Yes. The E theory is that the gene flow of out of Africa was in the form of a new species that replaced other people. Sure. And that is the big difference between these theories. Okay. Was there replacement, evolution by replacement, or evolution by natural selection? Okay, so, so you're saying that um, the driver of, of multi-regionalism then would be natural selection? Absolutely. Okay, okay. Absolutely. But the thing about multi-regionalism is this, I named it, it's my mm -hmm. name. I didn't think of it. <laughs> yeah, 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 I see what you're saying. Yeah, there, there is a wonder, uh, Franz Weinreich, who, who you know, is an uh, old German uh, uh, paleoanthropologist who published many of these ideas in the 1930s and 40s. Yeah. But a Russian geneticist, Dujansky, Theodosis Dujansky, he's the one who really understood everything. Okay. And he published a paper uh, writing about Weinreich in 1944, it's a long time ago, where he outlined what we now call the multi regional model. Okay. That, that human populations spread across many regions could all evolve in a similar manner when that evolution involved genes under selection, okay. because genes under selection spread everywhere. I have a poster in my office. It's a gorilla. Mm -hmm. So actually, it's a, it's a baron and billy poster. But, but, but John Hawks, who was my student, put 900 pounds on that gorilla because John always calls selection the 900 pound gorilla of evolution. Okay. Because selection does whatever it wants. Okay. So, yeah, it's a selection driven model based on uh, uh, the precept that human populations are connected. So, you would, um, so you, I need to go back and look. I mean, this is, um, 
this just tells you how you know things change. I mean, I've, I've read some of your papers. I mean, I know some of your papers from the late '90s into the 2000s, but no, I have not read the 1984 paper, so I need to look at it now because it will probably. Oh, you'll cry. It will pro I, 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 if I can just go back in the mm -hmm. past and rewrite that mm -hmm. in English, mm -hmm. so people can understand sure, it. Sure, sure. It's terrible, baby. It's awful. Okay. Okay. I mean, I mean, do you think part of the issue with understand with um, mitochondrial Eve versus multi-regionalism did have to do with comprehension? Because mitochondrial Eve is a very, it's a very parsimonious, um, elegant it's a very model. Very simple idea. It's a simple, elegant yeah. model. Absolutely. I think that played a large role. Okay. But I think another play, another thing that played a large role is historic. Uh, when we began to discover multi-regional evolution and out of Africa are older than mitochondrial DNA. Mm -hmm. Out of Africa comes really from the works of a German anthropologist, a German American, Reinhard Pratch, okay. who wrote in the mid 1970s that I mean, he took a direct view of, of human fossils. And he said, if you look at the dates of human fossils, modern fossils are older in Africa than they are anyplace mm -hmm. else. Therefore, moderns must have evolved in Africa and spread. I see. And, and that, that was before the genetics were done and before it became an issue of speciation. But that, I mean, that was a clear statement, and we all understood that. But it got mucked up later with with the Eve theory because a lot of what happened in the Eve theory, that should have clarified, in fact, was messy mm -hmm. because we were not well understood. And let's just attribute it to bad writing. Okay. I don't, I don't think there's an evil demon that made people misunderstand us. But I think we were pretty understood, and, and there's an awful lot of work that relied on the interpretation of Eve people to explain what multi-regional evolution is. Okay, okay. I mean, there's, a, there's an American anthropologist paper, a big paper. Uh, it's a big series of papers published in the late 1980s where we discussed all of this. Mm -hmm. and, and everybody, everybody put their drawings of what multi-regional evolution was. Mm -hmm. and, and none of it looked like ours. <laughs> well, I mean, we can't, I mean, obviously we can't, um, you know, do like a, a, a PowerPoint interregnum, interregnum here. But I mean, could you describe um, kind of the way the trees look from your own perspective? From my perspective, uh, what we probably should have published very early as a drawing, we didn't do that, and we should have. Mm -hmm. From my perspective, the, the, the trees do not describe what happens in human evolution. Tree, tree, uh, this is something Weinreich understood back in the 1940s. Okay. Human populations don't keep on splitting from each other, split, 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 split. If they did, our history would look like a tree, because that's what happens in a I tree. Uh, the, there's branches, and the branches become twigs, mm -hmm. and the twigs become sprouts, and every one of those is a split. But what happens in human evolution is reticulation. Yeah. Populations also come back together. Yeah. Parts of one population join another one. Yeah. And so that w you could use a tree to show that, but you don't show it correctly. I, can I, can I interject? You, you have to show that, you have to show that with a network. Can I interject here? Um, one thing, one yeah. thing with mitochondria for the, for the viewers, um, one thing with mitochondrial DNA is since it's passed only through the mothers, it does exhibit more of a tree phylogeny just because... The, it is a tree. Yeah, there, it has to be a tree. By definition, yeah. there's no because, recombination. So. Right, right because, because there's only one chromosome. There's no, two, there's no paternal and maternal chromosomes that come together. It always will only split. Sure. And so mitochondrial DNA will always look like a tree. Yeah. If you think that reflects human evolution, then you could draw human evolution like a tree. And uh, to be honest, trees were used for eons to draw evolutionary questions. Uh, I think not yet. Let's start with Ernst Haeckel mm -hmm. at the turn of the last century. began to use trees to, to express all kinds of phylogenies and species. And a tree works for species because species don't come back together. Yeah. So if we're looking at species, they branch, 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 branch. The problem is, is what happens when you use these to reflect human evolution? Mm -hmm. If you assume that all human evolution is about species, species replacing each other, then a tree would be valid. Mm -hmm. but when Ian Tattersall, my good friend, shows human evolution as, as, as a tree, everyone involving a different species, he's not wrong, he's right, because that's the way he looks at human evolution. Yeah. But if you think human evolution doesn't mean speciation, but means genetic change within a species, then trees don't show it. Mm -hmm. And when you, if you use a tree, it's misleading. Sure. I think, I mean, basically what you're saying, out of Africa kind of was, was predicating a speciation event 200,000 years ago. But your, your, yep. your hypothesis doesn't have any that sort of sharp discontinuity. 
Right. Not that, not a speciation of that that lived out recently. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a really good speciation of that uh, back um, maybe toward the end of the Pliocene okay. when, when Homo appears. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, among among other Australopithecine species, that, that, that's evidence of a good speciation. Mm -hmm. I think after that, there's there's probably no good evidence, genetic or anatomical, of a speciation where one species replaces all, all the other ones, which is which is easier. Mm -hmm. the, the thing is, is that I, I think we all understood that early in the game. What the what the difference was, and what was important for a very long time until people did nuclear DNA, is how to interpret the mitochondrial DNA, how to interpret mitochondrial evolution. Mm -hmm. If you use mitochondria to trace a lineage, if you want to say, because we know we, we know the common ancestors of mitochondria are, that tells us the common ancestor of all the populations mm -hmm. that have that mitochondria. Yeah. That involves an assumption of neutrality. That only works. You can only do that validly if 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 mitochondria are mutual, uh, are mutual, so that there's no there's a steady change. The whole the story about a mitochondrial clock requires that you think that mitochondria are neutral. Uh, let me interject here. Neutrality basically means that natural selection is not an effective parameter on, on evolutionary change. That's so. that's right. That means it doesn't matter yeah. what form of mitochondrial DNA you have. Yeah. That doesn't affect your, your survival. Yeah. If that's true, then there's a clock, and then mitochondria could reflect population. Uh, the, uh, but if there's, if there's selection, which is something that we thought from the beginning, if there's selection, then mitochondria can't answer that question about time. So, uh, Dr. Wolf, let me just let me get you on the record here because I'm curious. Uh, would you uh, do you have like, do you have any confidence at all um, of the current revised model that say ninety to ninety five percent of of current human uh, her current human genomic ancestry is derived from Africa within the last hundred fifty thousand years? They do. Ex well, we were, when we were multi regional evolution, we had no idea how much. Okay. How much never came to play in our thinking because we had no way of estimating how much gene flow out of Africa. Yeah. We recognized that the predominant direction of gene flow was out of Africa where there's more people to the human peripheries where there are fewer people. Sure. That's what we got right. Yeah. We never, ever, ever guessed at how much. Yeah. What we think is that how much doesn't matter. What's important to us is what's under selection. I see. If, if everything under selection came from Africa, then it would look very much like out of Africa. Yeah. But if things under selection came from many places, which is what we believe, yeah. and we think the genetics show that, that's a multi-regional model. Okay. But that's not about how much. That's about where things are reaching. I see. So you're looking at a slightly different, different, yeah, okay. I see what you're saying there then. It's what we always said. This part is what we always said. We got this part right from the beginning. I would never say we got it all right. Mm -hmm. I think that anybody said they got it all right from the beginning has a poor memory. So would you? Everybody changed their model and understanding as there's more and more information. That's what science is supposed to do. So would you? But there's parts of it I think we really did get correctly, mm -hmm. and, and this is one of them. This part of it. So would you say that? Would you? So like, going back to what we were saying in the beginning, um, would you say you were never in a minority position within? Paleoanthropology. Um, Within paleoanthropology, I would say we were never in a minority, we were never in a minority position. Mm -hmm. To start with, an awful lot of Americans come from me. Okay. <laughs> I, I have a lot of students. Yeah. And yeah. There's, there's other schools of thought that that really go along with this, and there certainly are others that absolutely do not. Yeah. And and, and that sort of conflict, that tension, if you will, has always been part of paleoanthropology. We train people differently, mm -hmm. um, and, and so that we end up with different people with different thinking. And for instance, mystery to me, Clark Howell. Somebody who absolutely, I never, I like Clark. He's, he's gone now. I really like him. Mm -hmm. And he's a critical figure in American physical anthropology. And he didn't have that many students. And it turns out that two of his students are multi regionalists. Okay. And I never would have believed that if someone would have told me that before I knew the people. Mm -hmm. But he, turned, he ended up with two multi regionalists. Okay. I think it's because of Berkeley, Washburn, Sherry Washburn, mm -hmm. the, the older Berkeley professor, the one who uh, really founded the program there, Washburn was a multiracial, so he wouldn't have called himself that. Mm -hmm. but, but, but reading Washburn's work, he never, he almost never addressed these issues. Okay. But when he did, uh, that's where it was coming from. So it's not, it's not necessarily more for students versus other students. Okay. But, but there's a lot of people out there. and. Uh, for the most part, I think if, if you could pull everybody, mm -hmm. not just the ones that make the news, or, and this is really important in our profession, not just the ones who discover fossils. People who discover fossils get a better platform mm -hmm. than the rest of us.
But if you pull everybody, everybody who taught it, who thought about it, who wrote about it, I would always say that these were both viable theories. A lot of people held both of them. Okay, so the, the fossil discovery people, would you say they were majority out of Africa then? The ones in the field? I would say the, one, I would say the more recent ones, yeah. Okay. I would say the ones of the last two decades, yeah. Okay. I think so. Okay. I watched my own student Tim Hoyt go back and forth. Tim is now out of Africa. It used to be, uh, <laughs> but, but a lot of the fossil people, a lot of few fossil people have gone that way. Mm -hmm. okay. um, I, I think one of the things about paleoanthropology is that some some thinking in paleoanthropology is that to have an opinion about human evolution, you've got to be somebody who fights fossils, mm -hmm. and others like me think that finding fossils is fun. I'd love to do it, but there's other ways of getting at the issues of human evolution. Studying the fossils is probably just as good a way as finding them. So yeah. I don't think there's a I don't think there's a preferred lecturer on this. I don't think one paleoanthropologist is better at understanding things than another. I think we all come to it from different places, and we all bring different things to it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, there was a, a um, an article about you and Chris Stringer. Chris Stringer is um, a, another paleoanthropologist, a fossils guy that yeah. was long ago. You know, primary public face of out of Africa when it came from probably the, the fossils uh, perspective. Um, there was a profile of you and him and science and your ideas and the reconciliation. I mean, how, it was by Ann Gibbons. Um, how did you feel about that profile? Just out of curiosity. Hey, I felt shame on Ann. Okay. Ann, Ann, Ann interviewed me for that. And we talked about a lot of stuff, but we never talked about our relations with Chris. Okay. And if we had, I would never have said anything. Okay. Because Chris and I get along poorly. And for me, I think that saying anything, I have a lot of reasons why I don't like Chris did this, that, and the other thing. And, and if I made all these public, we'd get along even worse. I see. And I don't think we ought to be doing it. So Ann got this stuff not from me. Okay. All the sort of gossip part of it. And she never asked me. She never, in fact, I wrote her about this. And she wrote, well, I was really busy. And so I could only talk to one of you. So I, talked, I asked Chris if those things were correct. Okay, so... But, but I didn't think I was actually right. I think okay. if you're going to publish personal statements, mm -hmm. then you ought to get it from both sides and then decide what to do. I see. It. Okay. I did not. Okay, that's good to know. I don't know. Nobody knows that. And nobody's going to know that. I can't publish a paper about this. And, you know, Anne did what she did. Okay. And she was busy. Anne's always busy. I, I wouldn't have made that choice myself. Okay. Well, I, it's I in the public because record. Because it's about me. It's more important to me than it probably is to her. It's in the public record now, I guess. Um, yeah, I know. I know. So, I mean, have you... Have you gotten more interest from from reporters or the public? I mean, in terms of just with the the new genetic genetic findings, um, have people contacted you more? Have you noticed anything different? You know, I, I am I am persistently uh, contacted by reporters. Okay. I, I wouldn't say that I'm contacted more or less than I have been in the past. But you know, I'm 68 years old, yeah. and reporters should go to younger people, and they usually do. Okay. You know, I, John Hawks is my student, yeah. so don't let him go to John. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, funny are going to him. Funny are reading his blog. So I think I love it. I, think, I love yeah. it. I, I love his blog. I don't always agree with his blog. Mm -hmm. I'm fire him off. If I don't agree with it, I'll fire him off some comment or other. And sometimes he answers them on his blog, and sometimes he doesn't. Okay. But I've always had I have a good relation with him with all my students, okay. and, uh, and we we enjoy throwing things back and forth. Okay. And, and all, some of my students. Don't agree with anything I do, and some agree with a lot of it, and some agree with most of it. But that's that's what I wanted. I never wanted to teach my students what to think about. Mm -hmm. I wanted to teach them how to think. So I mean, this was a topic I wanted to hold for later, but I guess let me just—it seems appropriate to ask right now. I mean, mm. from the Gibbon story um, in Science, uh, it was presented kind of as a reconciliation of out of African multiregionalism. I think. Would you would you say that's accurate? Yeah, I, you know, I, I'm not sure what she was up okay. to. With that. I think she was. I, I thought she was talking about a reconciliation of Chris and Nick. Yeah, that's, um, that, that's true. It, there's like there was a personal <laughs> and a plan. You have two, you have two theories. Yeah. One theory, if one theory is correct, the other one is wrong. Yeah. If evolution proceeds by species replacing each other, yeah. I'm wrong. Yeah. If evolution proceeds within one lineage, as genes under selection spread widely, then then Eve is wrong. Mm -hmm. And you can't reconcile these two. And it's not true that, like Mark said, that every time there's two different theses, you can get a, a synthesis between them. You can't always do that. This is, you know, Alan Ford, when he was active in this, he used to emphasize that a lot. Yeah. That they both can't be right. Okay. I mean, what do you, I think what that, do you think about, so, I mean, in terms of the, 
the out of Africa with assimilation model, like, would you even accept? I mean, that doesn't contradict what you're saying. That comes from Fred. That comes from my, my second student. Okay. When I, when I remember my students, by the way, yeah. it's never in order of how much I like them. I like them all. Okay. It's in order of their graduation date. Uh -huh. So, Fred, Fred, I graduated Fred second. That's it, right? And, and okay. some point, about 20 years ago, Fred, they started thinking about this and they wanted to publish on it, so he set off a little bar and he could publish it. And so, Fred, Fred's idea was to take multiracialism and say, what would it be like if the vast majority of what happened were Africans mixing with other people? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that he called that the assimilation model, yeah. which, is a, which is a way of interpreting multi-regional evolution. Yeah, okay. Okay, I see what you're saying. So it's, it's, it basically, you're, you know, if you think of multi-regionalism as, say, there are particular ancestral weights to the different populations, the weights might vary, but the overall dynamic... Absolutely. The overall dynamic... Dynamic would be the same. Yeah, okay. Yeah, well, you just said that better than we ever published it. We needed to publish that in 1984. Okay. Right? <laughs> well, um, because we did. so, you know, we've been talking about the scientific controversy and whatnot. Like, let's, let's move beyond the controversy. I, I'm, I'm curious about revisiting some of your ideas, as I have been doing. Um, but even before um, the Neanderthal paper came out, I did notice um, the Neanderthal paper in Science last um, June, just for viewer reference. Um, I did see um, it was a there's a geneticist at Cambridge, Luke Jostens, and he was discussed. He was having an argument, not an argument. He was having a discussion with John Hawkes about encephalization, um, and Luke Jostens produced a chart which, like, I think about relatively, I mean, a lot more than most people obviously, um, which showed concurrent encephalization across hominin lineages. So not only did hominins in Africa start to get bigger and bigger brains, hominins in you know, in Neanderthals, which is probably the main one we have other samples for of any like of a sample size that's robust. Not, tr not true. It's not robust. Not true. Okay. No, no, but the side, they, they, know, so they don't have to only have good okay, samples. Okay, okay, okay. So, there's, but there's, there's other good samples. But in cephalization, so basically the, the growing cranium, um, which, you know, we see we see huge craniums in our lineage, like primates in general um, for our body size, but also humans are probably the extreme end of that. Far bigger, that's yeah. right. Yeah. And so, um, we see it all across the hominin lineages. It's not just in Africa. It's not just the out of Africa people. It's and so, absolutely true. So I almost wondered: Was humanity as we understand it was anatom was was modern humanity inevitable in a way? Were there was there some? Yeah, you yeah, yeah you asked that in your questions to me. I mean, that's a really interesting question. Yeah, it, it's an interesting question. Um, with something like brain size, it's a good example of why it's so damn hard to answer that question. Yeah. I don't think anything in evolution is inevitable. So, in some sense, I suppose I don't think it's true. Yeah. But human brains increased in size through the Pleistocene across the whole human range. Yeah. That, that's true. And, it, and modern brains are not the same size from one population to another. Uh -huh. And another part is, nobody knows what that means. Uh -huh. we, we don't understand why Native Australians have brain sizes of maybe 200 cubic centimeters smaller on average than Chinese do. Uh -huh. And part of the reason we don't understand that is that in any population, we can't find a relation between brain size and anything else. Uh -huh. It's not true that you could measure some, or like my kids used to say, <laughs> my, my, my son said when he was five, he says, well, men are smarter than women. <laughs> I said, what are you talking about? He says, well, they have bigger heads. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but there's actually no, there's no evidence for that. Yeah. We, we don't actually know what, what brain size does in that kind of I sense. See. Look, everybody understands that Australopithecus, with a brain size one third of ours, yeah did not have human intellectual capacity. Yeah. There's no question about it. But when we start looking at the details of human brain size and ask how does it relate to the complexity of the behavior that they can understand, how well they can say sentences, what kind of information they can, uh, they can, they, they can understand mm -hmm. and transmit, nobody can, really, nobody can really put their finger on what that's all about. Yeah. In fact, there's some papers that are related to climate. Yeah. And say so that, that this is just part of the coal adaptation, you get bigger heads in the northern hemisphere. But the reason I'm bringing all this up mm -hmm. is because we see brain sizes increasing everywhere, everywhere we have a record, mm -hmm. but they don't all increase to, to the same extent or the same way. Okay. So, for instance, these native Australians who have, uh, who have brains uh, that are smaller than, than their neighbors in China, uh, but the history, in the history of, of the region, that brain size has reached really in the middle Pleistocene. Okay. 
Okay. And these are, these are modern human people who have, as far as we can tell, fully compli the, the complexity of their language and culture and behavior is the same as everybody else. This is something that actually people recognize now. Can you, um, just, just, for, just for viewers, um, can you, and listeners, can you a middle place to see how many hundreds of thousands of years ago is that? But the middle place, we, we take the place to see and in a very simple minded manner, we say it's early, middle, or late. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Except that it's lower, middle, and upper. Mm -hmm. They mean the same thing. Mm -hmm. and, and the lowest Pleistocene, or the early Pleistocene, begins three, uh, one, one to three quarter million years ago. And the middle Pleistocene begins about 700,000 years ago. And the late Pleistocene begins just a smidgen over 100,000 years ago. And these are geologic eras. Yeah. They have nothing to do with human evolution. So, They're just ways we talk about the geology, mm -hmm. so that we, we use the terminology when we talk about human ages. Okay. But, but but I would say this: if we looked at the world, if we looked at the world, see four hundred thousand years ago, you can make the case that in China and Europe, brains had not attained moderate size, and in Indonesia, they pretty much had. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. But if we look at the culture, if we look at the evolution of human culture, then you you never could think that I mean, there's no reason to think that that brain size relates to the cultural complexity. Okay. Cultural complexity is is very deep everywhere. Yeah. So, these things happen all the same, but it all happens different. I see. I see. Okay. Well, I mean, let's let's let's, let's move. It's, it's more it's more complicated than a story where everything happens the same way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, one, one of the ways that our theory was really misstated mm -hmm. by the other side for a long time is that well, they believe that that humans crossed the sapiens threshold at the same time. Mm -hmm. That evolutionary things happened to people at the same time, no matter where they were. Mm -hmm. And of course, we never thought that the archaeological record shows that. The archaeological record is very complex. People are complex things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. All we really know is that, is that as far as, as people who study culture, is that all cultures are really complex, and one is not more complex than another. Okay. Okay. And as far as I understand human behavior based on the brain, we can't compare human populations because most of what our brain does is culturally determined. The culture so so frees it. No, I shouldn't say that. The culture so so frames in the way our thought process works mm -hmm. that is really hard to compare thought process between one population and another. It's why there's so much trouble in this country, people trying to compare different ethnicities mm -hmm. in terms of how smart they were. I mean, they never could have answered that question. Okay. Okay, well, well let's let's, let's move from encephalization then um, to something like something else. What about longevity? Increase in longevity in the hominin lineage. Do you think that's that's a product of natural selection that's been persistent? I that's what my wife works on. Yeah, that's that's a, I, you, you pointed me to the 2004 did. paper. So I yeah, it's a nice paper in PNAS. Mm -hmm. You know, she had he she had an epiphany on how to look at longevity, and it was really important because it got around a lot of problems of aging specimens. Mm -hmm. Since the older individuals are, the harder it is to estimate how their their age of death. Okay. And so what she realized is is you got to stop looking at at how long people lived, but instead look at how many people lived to be old. I see. Stop asking how old, ask how many people live to be old. I see. By flipping that, mm -hmm. and, and stop, wonder, stop worrying about whether they died at 38 or 48, but ask how many lived to be over 30. Mm -hmm. She ended up showing that for most of human evolution, um, not, not that many people lived to be older. It was a statistic that changed a little bit over time, but not much. Okay. But with recent people, by which I don't mean modern people, mm -hmm. by recent people, there was an explosion of many people living old, mm -hmm. to be old. And the reason I raise that is that we can see no genetic people, be, no genetic difference between those people and their ancestors who didn't live to be old that often. Mm -hmm. They're all modern humans. Some modern humans, earlier ones, didn't live, very few people lived to be old. Now, then later, modern humans, many people lived to be old. Big change without a biological change. So it looks like a cultural difference. Okay. Okay. And uh, it was. So, so in, that, you know, in that sense, when you ask, is it inevitable? Gee, I don't know. I mean, yeah. it's spread everywhere. Yeah, that's interesting. That's interesting. I mean, I was just asking about the inevitability question because I was. It, it, you know, I mean, I, I guess, honestly, I don't think in terms of gene flow as much as you, obviously. So it seemed like when I saw encephalization, it seemed like a concrete concrete metric, and it was striking to me how, you know, it was... How, how, how it happens everywhere. It was happening everywhere, but, yeah. And so, yeah, it, yeah. you know... But, 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 but for me, gene flow is really important. Yeah, because yeah. Because we're, we're a species of praxis ex exogamy. Every human population, you have to find your mate outside your, your local group. Mm -hmm whether that's a clan 
or Modi or a village, you got to find a mate someplace else. There's gene flow everywhere. Mm. It was with, uh, with, when, when, when the ethnology of Australia was done back in the 30s, when there still were a lot of people living uh, living in the bush and not, not living in cities, and people went out and looked at them and tried to understand something about the way Australians lived on this horrible, horrible, difficult to inhabit continent. Mm. Um, they were getting mates from 60, 70, 80 miles away regularly. Okay. A long ways away. Yeah. They weren't just getting it from the next door group. Okay. And so this this looks like the way people have been. And, and once that's true, that opens up the possibility of natural selection spreading genes all over the place. Okay. So, uh, you know, I guess, like, let, me, let me just ask you then. Um, you, you accept that there has been some regional continuity um, of, you know, archaic homo sapiens in a given region, say, in China? I, I think there's been regional continuity, yeah. especially at the peripheries, okay. and I don't think that anything that really shows clear continuity is particularly adaptive. Okay. I think the things that really make a difference in how you live, they may be just related to a specific climate, but they're not generally adaptive, because if they were adaptive, they spread everywhere. I see. Then there wouldn't be showing regional continuity. So, I mean, I, you know, the old, an older, an older model, or uh, just an older um, example, I think is a shovel-shaped incisor, correct? Mm -hmm. So East Asians and Native Americans have shovel-shaped incisors, and Homo erectus populations, I think Neanderthals as well, have shovel -shaped. Actually, one of my students did a dissertation on this, okay. Tracy Kremen. Okay, why don't you... Was, uh, did one of your neighbors. And what Tracy did was, instead of asking that question, she asked it a little differently. Mm -hmm. I like having smart students. It's, it's a nice thing. And Tracy thought, instead of asking shovel and not shovel, she said, what are the elements of shoveling? And she decided there's three. There's the ridges you know, along, the, along the sides of the shovel, the, the, the parts that hold the colon, as it were. There's the shape of the blade of the shovel, whether it's straight or curved. And then at the very base of the shovel, some people have a, a tubercle, which is a bump, okay. and other people don't. Okay. And so she, she wrote a dissertation called The Three Dimensions of Shoveling. And she did, mm -hmm. she studied every fossil and large numbers of humans to look for how shoveling is distributed. And she did show regional differences in shoveling. Okay. In mm -hmm. Europeans, all the way until through Neanderthals, but not with moderns. Okay. The shovel was always curved. In Asians, the blade was always straight. Okay. So there, there's a case of a regional difference that I don't think it could make an adaptive difference. I think in terms of what the shovel does, if it strengthens the crown, it, it's not going to matter if it's curved or straight. But Asians are pretty consistent about this being straight, and uh, Europeans about being curved. And what, see, what I take from that is is that there was no speciation where one species came and replaced everybody. Mm -hmm. Because why would that new species take on the shovel shaping of the people who lived there earlier? Mm -hmm. Well, I, could, I mean, you're saying it's not adaptive, but I mean, the gene. I'm the it's gene, not. Yeah. It's, I know. I'm not. I'm not quite saying it the way you said yeah. it. I'm saying that the specifics are not adaptive. Yeah. Well, I mean, what if what it doesn't if, matter whether the blade is curved or straight. What if I mean, you know, there, like, um, what if the gene that the gene that affects development um, on that you know trait is pleiotropic, right? So it has a lot of different effects, and something mm -hmm. else is being selected for, and this is just a correlated mm -hmm. response, right? Could be. It could be. So I mean, I can't say you're wrong because the real the reality of this we don't really know about mm -hmm. the specific genes there, mm -hmm. and, and the only thing we're going to likely learn about in the near future are disease related genes because that's where the money is. That's what people are looking for. Yeah. yeah. I, I don't think we're going to find someone funding uh, a study of the genetics of shovel shaping. Yeah. I mean, maybe. I mean, we'll see. We'll see. I mean, like I know there's issues with statistical power, so and you know, but I mean, like there's just so many. It's getting so cheap, you know. I mean, it is getting it is getting so, cheap. Well, the money's run, running as cheap as it's getting. The money's running out pretty quickly. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I think some of the issues don't want to get sidetracked. The, the tractability of of some of the questions being asked in terms of traits is, is kind of a difficulty, right? Like the low hanging fruit. Yeah. A lot of that has yeah, been yeah, yeah. has been picked. So. But look how that's changed. Mm -hmm. when, when we started with the multi-regional EVE debate, mm -hmm. when, when people started doing uh, EVE theory genetics, mm -hmm. all of the geneticists were neutralists. They all believed that genetic differences, for the most part, didn't do anything. Yeah. That the big changes in evolution happened because of mutations, not because of selection. Dr. Wolf, let, me just, had, let, me just, you know, let me interject really yeah. quickly about neutralism, because sure. we have mentioned it. Um, just for the viewers, basically, 
Neutralism is the null hypothesis, which basic, which posits that most evolution on the molecular level uh, occurs through random genetic drift. Random yeah, change. Yeah, and so it's not natural mostly, selection. Mostly, mo mostly you're right, mm -hmm. but I would say it's a null hypothesis for geneticists before this decade. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, this was never the null hypothesis book for morphologists, because yeah. morphologists always start with a contention that if it's there, it must do something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a selection contention. And that's one reason, if you think about that, why there's so much, uh, historically, so much difference between the way geneticists and morphologists look at questions. Yeah. Because geneticists say, if you can't show me that, that there's a reason for it, it's neutral. And morphologists say, if you can't show me it's neutral, there's a reason for it. I see, I so see. So we, so we start from a very different place. We assume a morphological difference, and we assume, unless you can show otherwise, we assume there's a reason for it. Whereas geneticists assume it's neutral, okay. unless you can show otherwise. Now, that's not true anymore. Okay. And what made that not true was uh, all, this, all this nuclear genome sequencing and the ability to understand and sequence what the parts of the nuclear genome do. Because once that could happen, then you could look at disease. Yeah. And once you could look at disease, NIH will give you more money than you could carry in a bucket yeah, sure. if you could answer a question about disease. Yeah. Which means that the focus of so much genetic research in the last 10 years has changed from neutral studies to selection studies. Yeah. One reason you're seeing so many geneticists today ask questions about selection is because they're the new generation that learned to look at selection. Mm -hmm. They're no longer assuming neutrality. Yeah. Okay. That's that's a real follow the money story. Yeah. But I think there's a lot of truth to it. But I mean obviously the balance between neutrality and selection in reality is has been invariant. So I mean it's it's somewhat the effect what, of what what do you what do you mean by that? Uh just you know, in the objective world, um it is what it is. Just the focus has to do with the sociology and funding of of the culture of science, right? That's partly true, but it's also partly true that it's important that if you're studying something that you think whether you think it does something or not. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so in that case, it's not very. People studying mitochondrial DNA, you know, really up until this decade, all assumed that it didn't matter what kind you had. Yeah, that's not true, really. Right. And now people realize that's not true, so it makes a big difference in how they look yeah. at it. Well, I mean, mitochondria, I mean, just to review again, I mean, they're, they're really important. I mean, they're the power, energy powerhouses of the cell. So if there's any subtle variations, um, you know, in the, in the DNA, you know, in the mitochondria, that can affect things like metabolism. That's, that's the modern view. Yeah. But if you want to go back and look at the things in the last century, really, in my, my understanding is probably Doug Wallace. Well, who's a geneticist, that, uh, I think he's still in Georgia, I'm not sure anymore. Anyway, he said that over and over and over again, but most people didn't listen, uh -huh. Uh -huh. that we have to look at what these things do. Yeah, okay. But I mean, I think there's, there's been there's been correlations between particular mitochondrial line, lineages and, diver, and longevity, right? That's what I, we don't know that. Okay. Yeah. I would expect that was true, yeah, yeah. <laughs> to I be honest, okay. because a lot of the diseases of older age are, are controlled by the, uh, by the, by the misfunction of, of mitochondria, yeah. but we don't actually know that. Okay, okay. Um, let's, um, let's, let's jump real quick. Um, you want to talk about Artipithecus? Um, oh, only if you want to talk about it. I thought that we ran out of multivisual things. Well, I mean, you, you, what, let, yeah, I mean, like, I think, I mean, is there any other topic you want to hit on the multi-regionalism issue right now? I mean, like, what? I, you know, you, you want to talk about this, and my question would be, have we covered all the aspects you want to cover? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think, uh, I mean, we threw a lot out there, so I don't want to... You know, overwhelm the people out there who don't know. All yeah, the I, I, don't know I, I guess yeah. my if I had a message about this, uh -huh. it would be that there's a real sociology to science. Yeah, yeah. And while you learn in school, or you should learn in school, that science changes mm -hmm. as people refute hypotheses. Yeah, it, it's not, just not that simple. Yeah, it, it's not that simple to look at the way things actually happen. Well, and I think the multiracial story is a good example of it. Well, I mean, you know, I mean, I I did mention this in my blog post, which. Which triggered like an email exchange between us uh, when I was in when I was in university, um, you know, back in the day. Uh, I was taking an anthropology class, a physical anthropology class, and basically um, we were discussing multi-regionalism versus out of Africa. And the professor asked um, asked the class, and it was like a survey course, like 400 people, um, if uh, if an if anthropologists or if paleoanthropologists could find that there was a connection between 
erectine populate Homo erectus populations, uh, which are just um, an old, not an older, but I mean, just Homo erectus is the the first hominid that left Africa approximately two to one and a half million years ago. Um, in any case, there's a connection between them and Australian Aborigines um, morpho uh, that some anthropologists have said exhibits that exist morphologically. Should they discuss it? And the majority of students said no because it would um, it would give support to racism. And a lot of the out of Africa, at least in the pop culture um, material, implies that since we are all Africans, uh, well then racism is refuted. And I think even Richard Dawkins, who isn't, I remember in 2004 his book, um, he, he was accepting Alan Templeton's Out of Africa again and again, again and again. So he wasn't like a strict replacement person himself. He, he was, He's a multi Yeah, but he was, he was, he was promoting that shirt as well. And we are still, I would say, mostly African, but now the new genetic data pretty much refutes the idea that we're exclusively African. Does that then mean we should be racist? You know, I mean, like, do, can, can, making our values, I, 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 you know, values be contingent on I really think, and, and, and racism, we, the multiracists, did not bring racism into this discussion. Yeah, yeah. This is brought in by Rebecca Cam, who I think regretted it, and Gould, who never regretted it. He loved, loved, loved stirring the pot. Yeah. But, but we, we, we never thought that racism should be one of the aspects that we talked about. But then my wife and I, Rachel uh, Kasperi, and I ended up writing a book called Race and Human Evolution, A Fatal Attraction. Yeah. Because racism was so clearly involved in everything we talked about, yeah. and 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 while we were we were we were irritated by the fact that the Eve people were calling us racist, we weren't racist. Yeah, yeah. But the fact is, is that there's, that nobody should be a racist, and there's so there's such good reasons not to be a racist when we look at human variation. Well, I mean, it, humans don't feel racist. Let's start there. Our groups, a lot of groups of humans, none of them are racist. Yeah, well, racism I mean, biology is some species. If if you want to look at what a human race is, look at Neanderthals. Mm -hmm. They're a human race. Yeah, they're not here anymore. But that's what a human race was like. Yeah, the, we have many more differences between within populations than we have between sure, populations. Sure, sure. So I mean, and, and we never can find any difference between populations in anything that matters in terms of our in terms of who we are. Okay. Uh, it, uh, so the the basis of racism is not scientific. Well, I mean, racism is sociological. What do you say? I mean, one of the issues with I know um, with out of Africa is like I mean, it seems like the accusations against multi-regionalism uh, were more implicit in so far as out of Africa was given to be a necessary precondition. I think this was basically Gould's wasn't. Gould came close to saying that, didn't he? I mean, in, I think he said it. Yeah. And uh, Rebecca Khan said it. It was explicit. It wasn't implicit. It was a necessary I precondition think that, I think for Gallagher. away from it after a while yeah. because we shouldn't be doing science this way. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. And so, I mean, basically, uh, the uh, replacement with out of Africa has pretty much been refuted now because we have ancient DNA and we're still here and um, there aren't stormtroopers marching all around, right? So, I mean... That, yeah, that, that connection has been falsified <laughs> in terms of realization. Yeah. I mean, it, it, I think, you know, I think, it did, I, think, I think it's been falsified. Well, I mean, you know. Yeah. And, but, but if you watch the way science works, mm -hmm. science never works like it's been falsified so it goes away. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You'll just find people saying, well, we knew that all along. That's true. That's true. That, there is a tendency <laughs> to doing that, right? <laughs> we're just human beings. Look, one of the things I love to tell my classes is that if you really want to understand how science works, you just remember that science is a human activity. Yeah, yeah. And so it has it has all the the politics and distortions Absolutely. that are contained. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, I think you get it. At, at this point, though, I mean, you're would you are, are you pretty happy with with the direction that human evolution research is going then? You know, in some ways I am, and in some ways I'm not. Most of my colleagues are taxonomists, so all they want to ask is what species is it? And, and I don't think for the most part, in the course of human evolution, that that's a useful question. Okay. I think that we, we just stop seeing what the problems are and trying to understand what happened and why, and then we turn them all into species questions. Yeah. I don't think that's good. I, I mean, I'd like to see that go away, yeah. and maybe it will. I think it's hard to tell what the next generation is going to be like. I really hope the next generation are all, all the next generation of paleoanthropologists. I hope they're all geneticists. Okay. I think they should be. 
Well, I mean, God knows that's the way I train John. That's the way I train all my recent students. Yeah. All my recent students got a heavy dose of genetics. Yeah. Yeah. I just go back and think of my life where my advisor, Gene Giles, who knew everything, made me take genetics. And I so fought with him. Yeah. <laughs> I think I took it anyway. <laughs> I never understood why. <laughs> was yeah. Years, yeah. But I understood why he said, you're going to take this genetics course. Well, I mean, yeah. I think everyone should take genetics. I, you know, I, I love it. So um, I'm not, I'm not going to dis dispute with you there. Um, so just really quickly, um, we got we got about 10 minutes. So let's let's um let, let's hit Artipithecus because um, it was um that was the discovery. Uh, it was um the find. Well, I mean, I think Anne Gibbons kind of covered its excavation in her book, The First Human, I believe, and um, it's one of your students is kind of the principal behind a lot of the Tim White, Tim yeah, Tim White, yes. Berkeley, and um, Artipithecus is. Um, Okay, why don't you just describe what it is? Because, like, when it comes to fossils, well, Artipithecus like, is a it's a it's a primate uh -huh. that, that it's been known for twenty years. They took a very long time to publish it. Yeah. And uh, when they did publish it, they published it quite thoroughly and and really discussed it well. Uh, the work really is done by the, the biological anthropology part of it. It's done by Tim, yeah. my student, by Owen Lovejoy, who I respect really greatly. Uh -huh. I learned everything I know about bipedalism from Owen. Okay. Really, he's a really smart guy. He's one of the smartest people in the profession. It surprised me that when they published it, they were so sure it was a hominid. A hominid means something on the line leading to humans and not the line leading to chimpanzees. Okay. Because that's the last, the very, that's the last big speciation. Okay. There's a human line and the chimpanzee. And that's not, when would you date that? Just to give. I think most geneticists now are putting it at about 4 million years. Okay. Okay. That I think a decade ago it was thought to be 6, six million years. Yeah. It's very hard to date because all dates depend on paleontology. Yeah, yeah. And there were different ideas of the age of other species and when they arose. But, but for the most part, I think if you look at the last publications, the last 10 years of publications, I mean, so they have around 4 million years. And so I accept that. I know that the, that the Ardipithecus group does not accept that. They can't. Hmm. Because if the divergence was four million years, Oedipithecus is too early yeah, to be a hominid. Yeah. Um, so, so I, I, it's another case of, of there's a lot of sociology of science going on here. Okay. The Oedipithecus group are powerful people. Okay. If I was a young person who wanted to get grants for the next 20 years, I'd think twice before I published a paper about whether Oedipithecus was a hominid or not, because that's going to irritate a lot of powerful people. Okay. And yeah, I'm not sure you want to do that. Yeah. It doesn't always work well for you. But my own opinion about it is they, they, never, they never made a good case that it was a hominid. Okay. Because they never made a good case that it was a biped, that it was, exactly. it was can uniquely you, um, walking on two legs. Can you review just really quickly for the viewers out there like why it was important in terms of bipedalism and whatnot? Um, I think Lovejoy was the one who did the theoretical exposition of that, right? Lovejoy did well, everything, and he did it wonderfully. Mm -hmm. But the actual thing all comes from Darwin. Okay. Who said, who basically postulated that humans are apes living in trees. They came down to the ground. Mm -hmm. They began to carry tools and weapons to defend themselves. Uh, they were bipeds so they could carry that stuff and that their canine teeth reduced because they were replaced by those tools. Yeah. The basic fundamental idea. And I have to say that but while nobody believes those details anymore, mm -hmm. the, the idea of what a hominid is, is still caught up in the one remaining feature. And that is bipedalism. I'll make it bipedalism. Yeah. That means that you can only be a biped. You can't, there's no other alternative form of locomotion. Mm -hmm. Because uh, Darwin thought brain size got big early. It didn't. He thought that the canines disappeared and became small teeth early. They didn't. Mm -hmm. He thought two years was early. It wasn't. Mm -hmm. But up until now, the one thing that, that differentiates all humans and their ancestors from everybody else is obligate bipedalism. Yeah. This thing is not, I think, by the rendition of the office, it's not an obligate biped. Okay. It, it's not that it couldn't have walked on two legs, yeah. because many, many primates can walk on two legs, but the thing wasn't forced to walk on two legs all the time. Mm -hmm. And that grasping foot really tells a story, you know? Yeah. That, that foot that could grasp anything, Carol Ward, an undergraduate from Michigan, just published a nice paper on, the, on a toe bone from Haddow about three million years ago. Ardipithecus is more than four million years ago. And the Haddow toe absolutely belongs to a foot that has an arch. It can't be a grasping foot. It's a foot that's used like ours. Okay. So that, I mean, that, that's a clear anatomical uh, uh, demonstration that it's, it's a biped and that its foot can't be used in climbing. Mm -hmm. So I, I have to say, I, I, I learned everything I learned from Owen, and I can't understand why Owen no longer agrees with Owen. Okay. Huh. 
Because if he did, he wouldn't be promoting this as, an, as, a, as a biped. Okay. I don't think it is. So, I mean, is but, but that, I like to say it because what could they do to me? Yeah. 68 years old. <laughs> so, I mean, is a year on, like, well, it's been more than a year now since since the Artificus, um, since that paper was published, although, as you said, it's been known in the community for a long time. I mean, would you say? No, 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 no. Hmm. They, um, they were, that, it's been, it was discovered a long time ago. Yeah. But they had a code of secrecy, something like what they did during the Manhattan Project. Yeah, yeah. I'm not, Anybody who knew couldn't talk. Yeah. If they talk, they could have their head taken off. Yeah. I mean, there was a rumor 10 years ago that there was a, there was a grasping foot. Yeah. And everyone was afraid to say it. Okay. Okay. So I turned mean, out there was a question for So, I mean, a year and a half. But the thing's an ape. It's an ape living in trees. Okay. It, it may be on the human line. It may be on the chimpanzee side, too. I mean, that, that's a perfectly good explanation. Yeah. And a lot of people think that. Or it may be just some third line okay. that, that didn't go anywhere. Yeah. But to me, the, 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 the odds of it being on the human line is very small, since there's obligate bipeds soon afterwards. I see. I see. I mean, odds. Like, what are your confidence on odds like this? Is it a high confidence, low confidence? I mean, I don't really know with a lot of the older fossils how you know equivocal or unequivocal people are. Whether that really is or isn't an ancestor. Do you, do you get what I mean? Well, you know, people. People. The only way they can determine ancestor is by looking at shared features yeah. that are unique to that line. Yeah. That, that's it. There's no other magic to it because they don't come out of the ground yeah. with writing on them. Yeah. what they really are. And in, in this case, um, the question of obligate biped is really pretty well settled. There are footprints of a biped 3.7 million years old. Yeah. There is a bipedal knee just a little bit over 4 million years old. Okay. And Ardipithecus, which is at its youngest, 4.4 million years old, is nothing like those. Yeah. Okay. Okay, well, I guess, you know. Little watch that pot. Watch that pot. It yeah. will boil for a while. Yeah. Okay. Um, I guess we're about an hour now. And um, is there anything you wanted to say? Um, there is. It was my pleasure to do this. Okay. And I've enjoyed reading your blog. Mm -hmm. I think you, you really get it. And, and that's good. You're not influenced by any particular person. You listen, you read, and, and you seem to understand. Oh, you know, every, everyone's influenced by people. But um, in terms of influence, I mean, I will, I will admit that I am... I will look at your 1984 paper. I, I am doing my own um, backtracking and rediscovering of the alternate intellectual history, which I probably downweighted simply because I did accept the public orthodoxy. You know, I mean, I'm not a Well, you know, in 84, if you want to talk about it for a minute, mm -hmm. in 84, we were still influenced by a man named Carl Kuhn. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and we've, we've not really done the, the deep history of any of this. Yeah, yeah, that's but, in your book, but, Race, but, race but, and but, uh, Evolution, right? The race and Human Evolution yeah. does that pretty well. Yeah, yeah. But if you, look at, you, if you look before the 1960s, mm -hmm. actually going into the 1960s, there was a third theory of evolution that nobody believes today. Yeah. We always get whitewashed with it. And that is that human evolution, humans evolved, different races evolved like different subspecies competing with each other. Yeah. That the driving force of competition was racial was racial competition. Yeah. And that drove human evolution and each race evolved some races evolved faster and others evolved more slowly. Uh -huh. The last person who really believed this and wrote about it was Carlton Kuhn. Yeah. And when we wrote uh, in nineteen eighty four, we were still fairly ahistorical. Mm -hmm. We didn't really, have, we never really had worked through where ideas, where our ideas came from. That happened later. Yeah. And so we we were we were happier about Carlton Carlton Kuhn then than we were later. Okay. Because Kuhn is a case of racism. Okay. Kuhn absolutely believed that the white race was the most advanced race, or maybe the yellow race, as he called it. Mm -hmm. That these were the advanced races, and that they were really more intelligent and better adapted than than other races. And so that 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 was a brush with dripping tar. Okay. <laughs> we probably should have avoided much better than we did. Okay. We never really explicitly addressed that in the 1984. We addressed it later when we realized that that the Kuhn's ideas are, were dangerous to us yeah. because they sounded something like us. Yeah. And we had to make it clear why we weren't Kuhn. Okay. And we did that, but it, it took a long time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, um, it was a pleasure talking to you, and um, I guess pleasure. definitely keep in touch, Dr. Wolfer. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Take it easy. Bye. Bye-bye.